So, <clears throat> I'll go to the documentation page, the beacons, and open the Eat Denver link. And we will be working through this guide to deploy and use a smart contract that reads from one of our beacons. And then, yeah, this starts off with what the beacons are made out of, which is the Ember Data API. So we specify what actual endpoints we are using here. So you can uh, go to the API provider documentations, which uh, I think is pretty unique uh, among Oracle projects to send you to the API provider documentation. But that tends to be what we do because we do like these very transparent API to Oracle service integrations. So there will be a few requirements to do this uh, thing. Uh, first, of the, first of all, you will need um, a blockchain provider URL, something that you would get from, for example, Infura or Alchemy or whatever else. Um, we will be using Polygon Mumbai uh, here because, well, it's just more stable and the faucet always works and stuff. So, but, so here I got a mnemonic and the provider URL, which is RPC Mumbai Mathematic today. And then, yeah, if you look at the requirements section, there is this command that generates a random mnemonic for you. So you can run this to get a mnemonic, and then plug this in your MetaMask, go to the uh, Mumbai faucet, and then get some testnet tokens. And then here is an RPC URL for Mumbai that you can use to deploy your contract and make the calls. And then, yeah, how, how you use that is, there's this credentials.example.json file in the project that you will clone in a moment. So you just need to copy paste it, rename it as credentials.json, and then fill the JSON in. Uh, and then, yeah, the, we have also set up the same beacons on Robston, Rinkeby, Gurley. So you can use any of those testnets as well. But as I said, we will be using uh, Polygon here. So we start by cloning the project, which is the beacon reader example. So you just copy paste this. Um, command git clone beacon reader example you obviously need to have git install to run this and then cd into that beacon reader example directory and then i already did this so i will not be repeating it here and then when you are in that directory you run npm install um, so that the dependencies are installed And then I already installed them, so this will not do anything. And then the first thing to do are, is running the local tests. So th there are these local tests under the test directory. Um, and then we mainly provided this because well, this is a project where you, need, where you need to read from an external dependency. So you will need to read our beacons. But when you're running your local tests, like you will not have access to these beacons. So you need to mock a beacon server so that it gives you, it pretends to give you an API result, but then you will be providing that value. And then if you look at the test script, it does all that. It uses this mock RRP beacon server contract with just, where you can just set a beacon value and then read it back just to pretend that that beacon exists on your local network. So here, when I run npm run test, so compile the contract and run the tests, and the tests are supposed to pass. So if you ever, if you will be building a beacon-based project, I recommend you check these tests out. So to like know how to implement the tests. And then we will first 
run the uh, guide on a local node. It's not a ganache, but the hard hat node. So first I'm running a node on another terminal. Uh, run if node. So this is essentially ganache. And then on another terminal, I will first deploy the nodes, the, the, the contract, sorry. <laughs> and then here again, we will be using the mock beacon server contract because the, the beacons that we operate, they are on these four test nets. They're not on your local host. They're not on your local Ganache. So you will again, will have to mock the uh, beacon values. So this is useful when you will want to build a front end to your project and it will connect to your local Ganache node and then you will you will test the UX of the thing. So here you can use this flow. So you can deploy here. So to see what act this actually does. I would recommend you to go to the deploy directory and there's a script called one deploy. Here it does like different things with respect to the network that you're using. For example, if you're using the local host, it deploys the mock RRP beacon server. If you're not on local host, it will not, it will instead um, get the actual beacon server contract address. So yeah, if you read through this, you will easily understand what's happening. So here we deployed the mock RRP beacon server, and then we deployed a beacon reader example. So let's look at the beacon reader example. But this is quite an quite a simple contract where we have this beacon server that there like this is some external contract that we will be reading the beacon value from. And then there's just a simple view function read beacon. We use a beacon ID and it gives us a value and the timestamp of that value. So we will come to how the beacon IDs work, but so this is as big as it gets. So the, the main idea is that each beacon has a unique ID. And then how this is derived, I will go through, but you will essentially need to either go to the documentation and find the beacon that you want to use and it will have an ID. So use that in your contract. And then there's also a services package that is used in the script where you call it with, or I should just show it here, for example. Um, data. You can see the API name, the beacon name, and the network name, and it gives you the beacon ID. So you either can check out the documentation or use this function. Um, so yeah, we are looking at the contract. So here it returns a value, which is an integer, it's not, 256 bits because you don't need that in most cases. Instead, it also has a timestamp in the remaining uh, space. So what this timestamp represents is it is so essentially the API provider signs the data when it's um, essentially fulfilling the requests. And then this timestamp is in that signature, which means that you are guaranteed that this value was read from the API at this time. And then this helps because the API provider could post the data on chain and the data could be confirmed one hour later, for example, because that's when the transaction got mined. And then if you depended on when the transaction got mined from the timestamp, then it would appear more fresh than it actually is. So instead, this is the actual time where the data was Red, so this is the more accurate uh, way of implementing things. 
And then here we're just returning the value and the timestamp. So obviously, if you're building a proper project with this, you would be writing this to storage or you would be using it some kind of a business logic. But I assume that once you get this in the contract, you know what to do with it. So this example is just the bare minimum of how you would read from a beacon. So, okay, so we deployed on localhost. And then to be able to read beacons, you need to be whitelisted. And then it, it works like for each contract that needs to read a beacon, for each beacon ID that it will read, it will need to be whitelisted. But then on localhost, we are working around that. You don't need whitelisting on localhost. So we are skipping that step. We will be doing that on Mumbai coming right up. But we are skipping the whitelisting step. So we will just now read the bacon, <laughs> read the beacon um, on localhost. And then the beacon value is one, two, three, four, five, six, because we mocked this value while deploying the thing. And the timestamp is essentially right now. And then if you look at the deployment script, you can see where actually the value was mocked. So here, if the network is localhost, we deploy the IRP beacon server, and then we make up a beacon ID, and then we set the beacon value so that we have something to read when we are using localhost. So this is how you mock beacons when you're developing on a on local host. So now we will do the actual thing on Polygon Mumbai. So here I'm running the deployment script for Polygon Mumbai. And we can turn off our local node. It doesn't, it's not needed anymore. And then I'm deploying on Polygon Mumbai here, I will not be deploying the mock RRP beacon server because we are using the actual beacon server that we are operating or updating values at right now. So we are only deploying the beacon reader example. And then in the constructor, we are using the address of the actual RRP beacon server contract. So if you look at the reference section here, we have the contract addresses for RRP beacon server. So it is actually using this address and not deploying it again at our end. Um, and then the next step is we want to wipe the deployed. So here, why we have this in this tutorial is that in production, normally when you want to read from a beacon, you will have to get whitelisted specifically because like this is the first part of Oracle service that, and then the whole point of the API provider doing this is to productize their service and uh, in most cases, monetize their service. So being whitelisted requires some kind of uh, payment, which you can find out by reaching out to the business open person from the API to DAO, and then they will let you know about like how much does a specific beacon cost on a specific network and what the actual specs will be, etc. But for test that purposes, we have this way of whitelisting yourself. And then, like, it's not done transparently so that you know that such a step exists. So I run the whitelist read, whitelist read the script for I. So this actually runs this script. So you can go through this to understand what actually happens. It's like we need to keep it pretty simple for you to be able to like solve it quite easily. So I would recommend you to. Like read all the scripts that, that are used in this guide, but now it says can either FA something something whitelisted until this state for beacon with ID, and then this is the EQSD beacon for Amber data. So note that when you uh, implement the deployment and the post deployment scripts properly, or like when you use the services API, you don't need to like type these in or hook paste these in anywhere. Like you can just do this automatically. It just happened here right now. And now we have the final step, read beacon, which calls the 
it calls this function and then just prints whatever it returns here. So here the beacon value is 3,169 and then six additional decimal points. We will come to like how we find out this is six and not eight or whatever else. And then the timestamp is this. So this was updated four minutes ago. And then you can use this value in your contract however you want. So going back to this guide here, in all the scripts, it says Polygon Mumbai. You can just re replace this with Rinkeby or Robson or Gurley. And the same thing works on all the other networks. And that's mainly because we are running the same beacons on those networks as well. And then another thing that you can do here is you can read beacons other than ETH USD. And then there's a beacon list there. So let's try to do that here. So here we have 20 beacons. And then they're running on four different testnets. So the, it doesn't make much sense to do like support four different testnets. So it's uh, it's a bit of a flex in terms of like how easily and fast and scalably we can set up beacons. So for example, there are 20 beacons here. It, it, it would have been easily like we could have just as easily set up 50 beacons per chain or 100 beacons per chain, and it is quite easy to do this stuff at first part oracles. Um, so, and then one property which um, the Airnode protocol and how beacons are specified is Amber Data has an Airnode address that is the same across all chains, which means that you don't need documentation per chain. So, for example, if you look at these beacon IDs, you can't see any like drop down for chains here because the beacon ID is same across all chains, which makes this quite easy because beacon IDs are derived from template IDs. Template IDs are derived from Airnode addresses. Airnode addresses are same across all chains, which makes the whole thing same across all chains, which uh, like it, which is quite neat, which makes like the open quite easy. And then how this is derived is the template ID is what defines the Oracle, the underlying Oracle request that uh, runs the beacon. And then this is derived from the air node address. So here, Amber data address, plus the, uh, the parameters that you're using to make the request. So here there's a pair uh, parameter, which is Aave USD. And then there's a path parameter. This is the JSON path of the returned response from the API. So we are parsing this and returning it. And then there's this type thing, which specifies like what the response should be typecasted to before returning. And then there's this times parameter, which is one million. So this is essentially what tells you that you should expect six decimal places from the return data because the response will be multiplied by a million. And then there's this look back period. This is an API specific parameter. So if you look at the API documentation here, so let's go back and then open this. So this is the endpoint that you're using in, in the speaker. And then these are the query parameters. So we are providing this pair parameter. And then we are providing this look back period, which is the number of historical data points used in the calculation. So this is a minute. So by default, it aggregates to the last 60 minutes, but they're using five. And the main point here is that when you're using this specific template, um, when you're using this specific template, um, the look back period will always be five. So we can change the look back period of the beacon without you knowing, because that would change the template ID, which would change the beacon ID. And then, like, we would be now updating a different beacon. So this is what provides the transparency in our data piece, is that if anyone other than Ember Data pushes the data, you will know. If we use any other endpoint, you will know. If we use any other parameters in our request, you will always know, because this is what the beacon ID is derived from. And then the APIs are combined from these be beacons. And then the APIs also have an ID, which is derived from the beacon ID. So if we change anything in how the DAPI data is um, collected, you will know because that will change the DAPI ID. 
so so the point was that the example used e is USD, so let's use a different beacon, let's say BTC USD. So the only thing that I will need to do is I, I will need to whitelist myself for the BTC beacon. And for that, I, I will simply replace this with BTC. And then while reading the beacon, again, this should be BTC. And then I'll run the whitelisting transaction. So I whitelisted for the BTC beacon, and I will read it. So it is 44,000 something dollars. So it is quite easy to switch between these. And then if you want to hard code these beacon IDs in your contract, you can do that. If you want to use this get service data function from, and then you get this function from the API3 services package, you can also use this function. So there are multiple ways of doing it. And then let's get back to the guide. So here we are saying that uh, Amber Data is at the moment using Airnode version 0.3 for this, and it's based on the request response protocol. The thing is, you can also build the beacons on PSP. Uh, and then we have a version 0.4 release at the moment, but as a user of beacons, you don't care about this at all because beacons are, are like a higher layer, higher level product than the protocol itself. So you shouldn't need to worry about what protocol the Airnode is using, what version the Airnode is. It is just this abstract thing where you read the value from the beacon. So the only thing that you need to care about is you're using the services package. And at the moment, it is version 0.1. Um, but then, as I said, you can just use these beacon IDs here, and then the contract address is here, so that you don't even use the API3 services package. But you are very much recommended to do that. And then here, we are uh, introducing the functions that you may want to use, which is whitelisting and getting the service data. Um, so there's some more um, whitelisting information here. And then, yeah, one interesting thing here is the, the monitor page. So we had a monitor page, and then we ended up making that public. So you can see all the beacon states uh, on all chains right now. So let's look at Mumbai. So we have all these categories. Let's, let's look at EFUSD here, for example. Now this is currencies against ETH, which we should check cryptocurrencies against USD. And as you can see, RA USD, Atom USD, AOX USD. And then, um, yeah, this is ETH USD, it seems to be pumping. But then, as you can see, it, it all tracks quite well. But then, if you look at some of these, they are more granular than others. And this is based on the deviation triggers. So this is essentially, so this is, for example, 0.5%, which means if the API response is off, or rather, if the beacon data is off by 0.5% or higher, we update the beacon value. So here, like if you had a line here, whenever it, the value hits the line, we just trigger an update, and now the value will be closer to what it actually is. So just, and then in some cases, you want this to be very non-granular because, for example, gas prices are very volatile, so you don't want them to be too low in terms of deviation triggers. So you use 5% there, etc. So, and then, yeah, let me just go back and um, show some other chain. And then this is the same exact beacons, the same exact values, the same exact beacon IDs. Everything works exactly the same across all chains. And this is actually all supported by a single layer node. So Amber Data didn't have to 
deploy an AI node per chain. If the same AI node uh, powering all chains, then this is done in an isolated way. It does, for example, a problem on a chain doesn't affect other chains. So this also makes this whole thing quite a in that if you wanted to do 10 chains instead of four, Ember data would only have to redeploy their node and it would, it would work on 10 different chains. So it's just yeah, easy enough. So, yeah, as a, as a final note, we are looking for teammates. So if you are interested, excited about this sort of thing, consider uh, reaching out to us. We have this jobs thing here where there are these openings, but then we also accept freeform applications. So consider, uh, or like rather, you can also reach out to us personally. And here in our documentation space, you can see all these other stuff, for example, you can see the AirNode documentation here, uh, where it walks you through how to integrate an API to an AirNode and then deploy that air node and then use it in your project, which is, I think, a valuable thing to do, even if you're only planning to use beacons or the APIs, it's still a good idea to know like how air node actually works under the hood so that you actually know that the stuff all works. So, uh, so there, for example, for API providers, we have all these guides and for developers, we have these guides. And also one more thing to check out is so here, in our AirNode monorepo under packages, there are AirNode examples. I think these are not in the documentation because these are more developer-oriented, but there are, for example, a lot of examples about doing some interesting stuff at AirNode, so I also recommend you to check that out. Other than that, we have the Beacon documentation, we have documentation for the DAO members where you learn about how to stake and make proposals in the DAO. And then we have the Oracle integration specification documentation, <laughs> which is a mouthful. But this is essentially the thing that you need to create to integrate an API to an air node. So, for example, here's an example OIS subject. It is entirely based on Swagger, so it will come to you as like quite familiar if you have ever used that. But for example, from here we drive endpoints, from endpoints we drive template IDs, from that we drive beacon IDs. And then that is quite immutable in that you know exactly what API call is lying under the beacon that you're using. So yeah, that's that's all. If you have any questions or uh, if you want to walk, walk through the guide and if you're stuck anywhere, just um, feel free to ask about it. Otherwise, thanks for listening.